Hi, everybody. Welcome to another COVID-19 update with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I'm Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and I'm so excited to be joined today by Dr. Steve Barker and Dr. Butch Loeb from the University of Florida. Dr. Steve Barker is the Chief Science Officer at Massimo and is a board member at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. He's also Professor Emeritus of Anesthesiology at the University of Arizona. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. It's good to be here. I am delighted to have with me my friend and colleague, Dr. Butch Loeb. Dr. Loeb is a professor of clinical anesthesiology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He is a recognized expert in anesthesia technology, computing, and human factors. Welcome to, to our webinar, Dr. Loeb. Good to have you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Good to be so, here. Thanks. And our first question is going to be exactly what is an anesthesia machine and how is it different from the mechanical ventilators that we use today in the intensive care unit? Well, that's a good question, Steve. And, and it's an important question because uh, during this COVID crisis, there are not enough uh, ICU ventilators to go around. And so there has been a movement by the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists to make anesthesia machines available to be used as ICU ventilators. But anesthesia machines are not designed to be ICU ventilators. And so there's some considerations that uh, need to be taken into account before they can be used in that way or to use them in that way. Anesthesia machines have sort of evolved over the years. When they were first used back before the 1950s, they didn't even have ventilators on them. Patients breathed spontaneously or were ventilated by hand by the anesthesiologists. But today's anesthesia machines all have ventilators as one of their components. And especially over the past 10 years, the ventilators themselves have become quite advanced and have a lot of the modes of ventilation and uh, mon monitoring uh, that you would find in an ICU ventilator. So they are more and more capable to ventilate ICU patients. There are some important differences. The uh, anesthesia machine has a breathing system that is very different from that of an ICU ventilator. If you think of how a, an anesthesiologist would squeeze a bag to ventilate a patient's lungs, the anesthesia ventilators really are more automated bag squeezers. And so there is the patient gas that the patient breathes, and there's what's called drive gas, which the ventilator pumps into a chamber to essentially squeeze a bag. And that's how most anesthesia breathing circuits are built. In all anesthesia machines, there's an attempt to try to have the patient rebreathe some of the gases that they previously exhaled and the reason for that is to preserve, not use up a lot of anesthetics. So when used in the operating room, we try to conserve the amount of anesthetics used by using techniques called low flow. But in the ICU, we know it's not a good idea because over long durations, the anesthesia machine is just it starts to have problems with humidity buildup within the anesthesia machine and cons consumption of disposables that become a problem. Another very important difference between an anesthesia machine and an ICU ventilator is that anesthesia machines were designed to be used with an anesthesiologist or an anesthesia provider right by that machine at all times. The alarms are set up for that. The machine is intended to be restarted every day to be used on the patients for that day. It can't be connected to a central monitoring station. So the whole user interface is not designed for use in an unattended way, the way an ICU ventilator is. So those are the two major things. Given those differences between an anesthesia machine and an ICU ventilator, how will we have to short-term modify these machines before we can use them to ventilate COVID patients? And who should make those modifications? And given all of these differences, who should be supervising the use of these machines in an ICU on, on COVID patients? We are already doing that throughout the country, especially in the places that have been hardest hit. Anesthesia machines have been taken into ICUs and used to uh, ventilate patients uh, for the long term. And it takes uh, some forethought and preparation. Anesthesia machines typically have a lot of other monitors 
mounted to them and computers mounted to them that are already present in the ICU. And so those need to be removed. Some of the connections to piped gases need to be considered where they're available, how the connections are going to be made, things like that. So there's some preparation involved. That usually involves clinical engineering and with oversight or some input from anesthesiologists to know how to make those uh, conversions. And then once the machine's in the ICU, it really needs to be attended to and watched over by an anesthesia provider. And that can be an anesthesiologist, a nurse anesthetist, a anesthesiologist assistant. And in most cases, it's usually a team of these people who are present 24-7, at least available if there are any problems, and rounding on the machines to check for problems, do maintenance-type things that need to be done. Anesthesiologists and other anesthesia providers are being pulled from their usual duties to do this. Most places are not doing elective surgeries right now. And so those providers uh, are available uh, to be used in that way. Right. That, that's a very good point. Uh, you mentioned problems. Uh, these are machines that are designed to ventilate patients for maybe a few hours, and we're going to suddenly start using them for days at a time. What specific problems would you expect uh, with the use of this technology in such a different setting? Are there potential medical errors associated that we should be concerned about making this adaptation? Well, one of the main safety issues that we are worried about is that because the breathing circuit is different for an anesthesia machine and because the patient re-inhales gases that they previously exhaled quite differently from an ICU ventilator, that there's more worry that the anesthesia machines could contaminate future patients because the patient with COVID exhales into that breathing circuit, and then you bring in another patient, and they potentially can re-inhale pathogens that have been exhaled uh, by a previous patient. We are recommending, and everybody's doing this, uh, putting high-efficiency filters into the breathing passageways in, of, the, of the anesthesia machine to filter out viruses. And we've actually recommended that those be located in two locations in the breathing circuits. The two filters both multiply the efficiency and also in case one fails, you have the second present all the time. But those filters, especially over the long term, tend to get clogged and can cause some problems. And these are issues that are really a bit unique to this whole situation. We are learning as we go in some ways and being as careful as we can. The user interface issue is also interesting. We have had respiratory therapists or ICU physicians who think, oh, here's this new machine. I can just set what I want. I know how to work a ventilator. I'm just going to put the changes I need in for this patient because they don't know the machine. For instance, in one case, made some changes that they wanted the patient to have in their ventilation, but didn't go through the steps in confirming that on the machine. And so those changes didn't happen. We are being as careful as we can about this, but certainly there is opportunity for error. Yeah, I I think we should stress that it is a different machine. It's very much like a pilot climbing into a very different airplane than the one he has been trained in. Uh, You mentioned sterility. Uh, My my last question, we have all heard proposals that uh, perhaps in a stressed situation and at one anesthesia machine could be used to ventilate more than one patient. What do you think of that idea? When uh, in last ditch efforts, uh, people will do what they can to save a patient. It's very hard not to provide care to somebody uh, simply because there's not enough equipment. Anesthesia machines are, I think, a good Squeeze first bag. <laughs> line. There are devices called transport ventilators. There are ventilators of a sort used for CPAP. Uh, for patients with sleep apnea at home. And people are coming up with simple ventilators that can be made easily or cheaply. So the U.S. is doing what it can to make 
as many ventilators uh, available as possible. But a last line is to put more than one patient on a ventilator. I say that's a last line. It's a solution fraught with problems. And unfortunately, the potential is there that in trying to save one patient, you might actually hurt more than one patient. It's very difficult to ventilate one patient with a ventilator with right. all of the monitors that come with it. It monitors what's happening with one patient. As soon as you start trying to ventilate more than one patient, you lose your monitoring because you can only monitor what's happening with both patients. You can't really tell what's happening with one versus the other. There is a big problem that you can overventilate one patient and underventilate the other patient. And of course, infection, cross-contamination is also an issue. It becomes a, a very difficult. It has been done, but in my mind is a last-ditch effort and should be done with, with extreme caution. And, and a number of societies came together last week and spoke out about doing it unless absolutely necessary. And because we're talking about anesthesia machines, anesthesia machines, because of their breathing circuit, they are probably less able to ventilate multiple patients. They're less suitable for that use, just the way the breathing circuit's built, not to mention that they are sort of the new guys on the block in the intensive care unit. So if more than one patient were to be ventilated at a time, I would suggest not using an anesthesia machine for that purpose. I think uh, your point is excellent and I, I believe we both feel exactly the same on this that should be considered a extremely last ditch alternative and hopefully we'll never have to do that so butch this has been an excellent interview we've learned a lot do you have any final conclusions or recommendations before we close unfortunately the the hospitals that are dealing with large numbers of covid patients are really in battlefield mode unfortunately it will increase the number of errors made. It, it's That's just right. the nature of how things are. People are stressed. They're doing things that they're not used to. Uh, they're scared. It's not a good time to be a patient in a hospital. I guess that's a, an important take-home message is that that's why, uh, as much as possible, hospitals are trying not to care for patients unless they absolutely need it. Well, that's... Uh certainly true and i guess i would add that it's also not an easy time to be a doctor or a care provider but we are rising to this occasion we have shown people are doing amazing things we are doing amazing things and i'm i'm proud of everybody for what they're doing and i'm proud of the patient safety movement for their part in this so uh, that's a you know we will get through this together yep this yep. kind of effort and thank you so much for your help. I will add that uh, there are resources available for anesthesiologists, hospitals that yeah. want to use uh, anesthesia machines as ICU ventilators. The American Society of Anesthesiologists website has a lot of material and we are going to start a helpline that the American Society of Anesthesiologists is funding so that people with questions, anesthesiologists with questions of how to do this can talk with an expert and get some direct advice from another colleague. That's wonderful. And, and tips and, and help like this is exactly what we want to help provide at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So thank you both for your time today. And I look forward to talking to you soon.